I'm in Dartington today, which is unusual because I usually go home at the weekends, back to Cheshire. But I wasn't able to do that this weekend, so I'm kind of hanging out on a Sunday, kicking my heels really, so I went for a bit of a walk. It is quite beautiful around here. Uh, I'm very attractive. I'm walking through this typical Devon lane, actually. I'll try and get on camera. Which has got these very high hedgerows at either side. They tend to fill up with the snow in winter, these lanes. They're fantastic. Uh, and there's lots to look at in the hedgerows. You know, there's lots of like things like rose hips and, uh, and brambles and different kinds of... Actually, I sound like I know what I'm talking about. I don't really know much about vegetation at all, but there's lots of different things to look at, and some of it's quite attractive, and some of it less so. Uh, and the attractive things are quite interesting. The fact that they are attractive is interesting. You know, the fact that these, these berries just seem to kind of stretch out of the bush at you. It's very tempting to pick some, and I do indeed pick the ones that I know about, but I know some of them are not good for eating a poisonous, so I'll leave those alone, but they also got kind of offered themselves. Uh, and what that's making me think about is aesthetics and attractiveness and ugliness. Because I guess what's happening with these berries is that they're presenting themselves in a way which is attractive. I don't mean any of the intentionality of that, but they're, um, they've evolved in a way which, uh, which gives them this presentational quality makes them very available, oops, car coming, which makes them very available to animals like myself, but also to birds and squirrels and all the rest of the stuff, so that they'll eat them and, and uh, propagate the seeds that way. Uh, and I think that's a kind of aesthetics going on there. And this, it's, I guess, links into that uh, developing discipline that's sometimes called evolutionary aesthetics, which I know a bit from uh, readings on Ramachandran and semi ezeki but I think it also, uh, oh god, what's she called? Diseniaki? I don't know, it's most associated with a couple of other people as well, whose names I'll, I'll try and track. Right. Uh, and what, what the, the basic philosophy or the basic idea behind evolutionary aesthetics is, is that, um, is that that sense of desire and the sense of wanting, the sense of attractiveness, and conversely, the, the sense of repulsion and ugliness that we have is uh, an evolved sense related to the relationships we have to the natural environment. So we are naturally attracted, at least in theory, are naturally attracted to those parts of the environment which can sustain us or can benefit us in some way, whether that be fresh fruit and vegetables growing on the hedgerows or whether it be... Uh, particularly attractive or fecund member of the opposite sex or a particular kind of landscape which seems to uh, suggest shelter and protection and, and, and fertility, that kind of thing. And I know there's a certain amount of evidence to support that and, and by contrast uh, uh, we tend to be repelled by those aspects of the environment, at least the theory goes, which uh, in, the, in some time in the Pleistocene period would have negatively affected the survival potentials of our ancestors. Uh, but of course, because we're living in, a, in, a, in an environment with other species, it's, it's more complex than that. So some poisonous plants look very attractive uh, as a kind of evolved means of subverting our aesthetic attraction or animals' aesthetic attraction for pretty entities. And some um, insects, for example, very vivid and very attractive as a means of signalling the fact that they taste horrible, as a, as a kind of warning signal. So there's, there's some complexities in that. But broadly speaking, I think the, the idea is that aesthetics, the, uh, the either positive or negative appeal to the senses, the visual sense perhaps, but also perhaps the, the olfactory sense, so things smell nice or smell repulsive, uh, and maybe the other senses as well, uh, underpins... Uh, well, those, those, that aesthetic appeal comes, stems out of uh, uh, survival potentials within a particular ecological situation. And in humans, has evolved into quite a complex and culturally embedded system that you find in arts practice. Wow, that took me a lot longer to, to say than I thought. 
Anyhow, the, the, the only bit I wanted to tack on to the end of that, and I'll try and speak more about this in the time, is that um, evolutionary aesthetics is about the look of things and the impact that things make on the senses. Things look the way they do, they smell the way they do, they taste the way they do, because there is a, uh, and that's either positive or negative, because they they have a kind of survival value attached to them, what they did at one time in our evolutionary history. What I'm quite interested in is not so much the way they look, but how they change, I suppose, how they change in our imagination, how we, oh God, I can't really get to this. Yeah, yeah how, how, what the difference is between what they are and how they appear, what kind of transformations are being made in that distinction between the way things appear to be in the world and the, the way things are in the world and the way they appear to us in our cognition. Like I know, for example, as I'm looking at this hedgerow opposite, that I'm only seeing a very thin strip of, um, of the electromagnetic spectrum, for example, the things that we call visible light. I know there are colours, in inverted commas, that I can't see, that other animals can see, and I know there's other kinds of properties, infrared, ultraviolet effects and other effects, which are way out of the range of my senses. So there's, there's certain things are going on with this. Certain transformations, editing processes are being affected to this environment, which is uh, transforming the data of the world into the stuff of my experience, as I'm kind of think of. And that must be evolutionary as well. There must be an evolutionary good reason why I can only see the visible, the parts of the visible spectrum that I can. And I can't see into the ultraviolet or into the infrared or detect x-rays or feel the impact of the solar wind, all those kind of things. There's an evolutionary good reason for that. Uh, and I'd like to think of that as a kind of poetic transformation, really harking back to the stuff I'm talking about on the other channel right now, that there's a, a poetic transformation taking place between the stuff of the world, to, so it becomes my the stuff of my experience, uh, grounded in adapt adaptation and the contingencies of evolution and that is best thought of as a kind of evolutionary poetics. Took a long time.